Defeating Evolution by Opening Minds, Chapter 4, Part 2. Eldridge also explains the pressure that could easily lead a forlorn paleontologist to construe a doubtful fossil as an ancestor or evolutionary transitional. Science takes for granted that the ancestors existed and the transitions occurred, so scientists ought to be finding positive evidence if they expect to have successful careers. According to Eldridge, the pressure for results, positive results, is enormous. This pressure is particularly great in the area of human evolution, where success in establishing a fossil as a human ancestor can turn an obscure paleontologist into a celebrity. Human evolution is also an area where the evidence is most subject to subjective interpretation, because ape and human bones are relatively similar. If you find an ape or human bone that's a bit unusual, can you construe it as a piece of pre-human ancestor? If you can, and if the other experts will support you, your future may be a glorious one. In light of these pressures and temptations, how confident should we be that fossils of human ancestors are really what they purport to be? Could the wish be father to the thought, as it so often is? To forestall outrage protests, I should emphasize that there is nothing cynical about asking these questions, nor do they imply that anybody is committing a deliberate fraud. Remember the wise words of Richard Feynman. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. Footnote 1. The ever-changing story of human evolution took a strange new turn late in 1996 when geochronologists announced a study from Java indicating that three human species, Homo erectus, Neanderthals, and modern humans, apparently coexisted on the Earth as recently as 30,000 years ago. The New York Times front-page story reported, until a couple of decades ago, scientists conceived of the human lineage as a neat progression of one species to the next and generally thought it impossible that two species could have overlapped in place or time. It also observed it is not known how much contact the three species had or if they could interbreed. If they could interbreed, then it would be more accurate to say that they were all a single species, Homo sapiens. Such huge areas of un uncertainty support my view that general conclusions about evolution should not be drawn from the human fossil record, where the evidence is scanty and the temptation to subjectivity in interpretation is particularly great. Today's fact is likely to be tomorrow's discarded theory. Think how easy it would be for the ambitious fossil hunters to fool themselves when the reward for doing so may be a cover story in National Geographic and a lifetime of research funding. Think how much pressure the other physical anthropologists are under to develop standards that will allow some fossils to be authenticated as human ancestors. A fossil field without fossils is a candidate for extinction. Keeping that in mind, why do you think such a high proportion of the fossils used to prove evolution come from this one specialty? Why do you think Niles Eldridge, a specialist in marine invertebrates, uses hominid examples rather than the vast record of fossil invertebrates to argue the case for evolution? If anybody tries to tell you that questions like these are improper, as they probably will, your baloney detector should blow a fuse. A scientist who objects to scientific testing is like a banker who doesn't want the books to be audited by independent accountants. View such people with suspicion. Learn the difference between intelligent and unintelligent causes. This is a distinction that many otherwise capable scientists do not understand because their materialistic philosophy teaches them to disregard it. I'll illustrate the point with a couple of examples. Tim Barra is a professor of zoology at Ohio State University. He wrote a book that was published by the Stanford University Press with the title, Evolution and the Myth of Creationism. 
a basic guide to the facts in the evolution debate. Barra's book has much the same purpose as this book. It aims to explain for non-scientists how good thinkers should view the conflict between evolution and creationism. Here is Barra's explanation of evolution, which comes illustrated with photographs of automobiles in the middle of the book. Everything evolves in the sense of dissent and modification, whether it be government policy, religion, sports cars, or organisms. The revolutionary fiberglass Corvette evolved from more mundane automotive ancestors in 1953. Other high points in the Corvette's evolutionary refinement included the 1962 model, in which the original 102-inch was shortened to 98 inches, and the new closed coupe Stingray model was introduced. The 1968 model, the forerunner of today's Corfret morphology, which emerged with removable roof panels, and the 1978 silver anniversary model with fastback styling. Today's version continues the stepwise refinement that have been accumulating since 1953. The point is that the Corvette evolved through a selection process acting on variations that resulted in a series of transitional forms and an endpoint rather distinct from the starting point. A similar process shapes the evolution of organisms. Of course, every one of those Corvettes was designed by engineers. The Corvette sequence, like the sequence of Beethoven's symphonies or the opinions of the United States Supreme Court, does not illustrate naturalistic evolution at all. It illustrates how intelligent designers will typically achieve their purposes by adding variations to a basic design plan. Above all, such sequences have no tendency whatever to support the claim that there is no need for a creator, since blind natural forces can do the creating. On the contrary, they show that what biologists present as proof of evolution or common ancestry is just as likely to be evidence of common design. I described the credentials of Professor Barra and named the publisher so nobody could accuse me of attacking a straw man. A distinguished university press would not publish such a book without obtaining professional reviews, certifying that its scientific explanations were reliable. Evidently, the reviewers saw nothing wrong with equating automotive engineering and biological evolution. I am not surprised because evolutionary biologists typically do not understand that sequences resulting from variations on common design principles, as in the Corvette series, point to the existence of common design, not its absence. I have encountered this mistake so often in public debates that I have given it the nickname Barra's Blunder. A somewhat more sophisticated version of Barra's Blunder is to confuse artificial, that is, intelligent selection, with natural selection. Francis Crick, who was a celebrated molecular biologist and a fervent scientific materialist, argued the case for Darwinism in these words. If you doubt the power of natural selection, I urge you to save your soul to read Richard Dawkins' book, The Blind Watchmaker. I think you will find it a revelation. Dawkins gives a nice argument to show how far the process of evolution can go in the time available to it. He points out that man, by selection, has produced an enormous variety of types of dogs, such as Pekingese, Bulldogs, and so on, in the space of only a few thousand years. Here, man is the important factor in the environment, and it is his peculiar tastes that have produced, by selective breeding, not by design, the freaks of nature we see preserved all around us as domestic dogs. Yet the time required to do this on an evolutionary scale of hundreds of millions of years is extraordinarily short. So we should not be surprised at the ever greater variety of creatures that natural selection has produced on this much larger time scale. Was Crick aware that domestic animal breeding requires a pre-existing purposeful intelligence? He seems to have sensed it on one level and then wished the ugly fact away by verbal antithesis. Selective breeding, not design. Once again, we see the truth of Feynman's warning. 
the easiest person to fool is yourself. Only a powerful unconscious need to overlook the truth could have allowed Crick to conceal from himself that animal breeders are intelligent agents, not blind natural forces. Breeders use expert skill to select just the variants they want, and they carefully protect their over-specialized breeds from the natural selection that would otherwise prevent such freaks from surviving to reproduce their own kind. Selective breeding is not the same thing as natural selection or even analogous to us. It is intelligent design. Critical thinking is good for religion too. Every scientific materialist who reads this will understandably want to ask, are you willing to apply the baloney detecting to religion as well as science? The answer is emphatically yes. I can't think of a better way to introduce students to Christianity than to invite them to read the Gospels with care and to ask all the tough questions. I am not particularly worried about how they answer those questions the first time through, though. Dealing with the tough questions is a lifelong business, and the most important educational point is not to try to spoon-feed students with oversimplified answers that won't stand the tests of time and experience. Here are two examples of the kinds of issues I like young people to begin to think about. 6. The Problem of Suffering One of the seeming advantages of Darwinism is that it makes it unnecessary to ask why God permits the innocent to suffer, and sometimes the wicked to prosper. In a materialistic universe, moral arbitrariness is only to be expected. As Richard Dawkins puts it, Nature is not interested one way or the other in suffering unless it affects the survival of DNA. Some religious people actually like Darwinism because they think it gets God off the hook. If for some reason the divine plan involved creating by means of scientific laws, then God couldn't intervene to prevent suffering without spoiling his own grand scheme. I don't find that convincing, but it's clear that some Darwinists believe in their theory less because of the scientific evidence than because they have theological or philosophical objections to supernatural creation. Of all the errors of scientific materialism, the silliest is that resolution of the Natural Academy of Sciences that religion and science are separate realms that should never be considered in the same context. On the contrary, Evolutionary scientists are obsessed with the God question, and the problem of suffering is one of the important aspects of that question. I would tell students that none of the usual answers to the problem of suffering is entirely satisfactory. I'd want my students to have some familiarity with the classic treatments of the problem, especially the Book of Job and the Grand Inquisitor section of Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov as well as a good Christian apologetics like C.S. Lewis, The Problem of Pain. I'd want them to read the Psalms and the Gospels with the problem fully in mind and think about whether and how the suffering and resurrection of Jesus help with it. I'd want them to understand that some of the appeal of Darwinism stems from classic philosophical objections to the doctrine that the world is governed by a creator who loves us and cares about what we do. Above all, I'd want them to face the fact that if science has its unsolved problems, so does religion. We all see through a glass darkly, but what glass should we try to see through? The Problem of Faith One of the illusions of scientific materialism is its insistence that materialists don't have faith commitments. Faith is not something some people have and others don't. Faith also isn't something opposed to reason. Faith is something that everybody needs to get started in any direction and to keep going in the face of discouragement. Reason builds on a foundation of faith. For example, scientific materialists have faith that they will eventually find a materialistic theory to explain the origin of life, even though the experimental evidence may be pretty discouraging for now. Because they have faith in their theory, Darwinists believe that common ancestors for the animal philia once lived on the earth, even though those ancestors can't be found. 
Niles Eldridge, calls himself a knee-jerk neo-Darwinist in spite of the invertebrate fossil record because he is convinced on philosophical grounds that the theory must be true. That's every bit as much of a faith commitment as the belief of a young earth creationist that all radiometric dating must be wrong because it contradicts the literal words of Genesis and because it is a lot easier to deal with the problem of suffering if pain and death first entered the world after human beings had sinned. Given that every position has its difficulties, where should we put our faith? To use the words that Jesus taught us, what is the foundation of solid rock and what is the foundation of sand? The Christian says the rock is God and we should trust in the goodness of God all the more when the presence of evil and suffering inclines us to doubt. The materialist says that the rock is matter and that we should never move from an unshakable faith in science and materialism even when we begin to be discouraged by the difficulties of explaining all the things that do exist without allowing a role to a creator. Beginning a new century and a new millennium. Whatever their faith commitments, good thinkers ought to be dissatisfied about the way things stand at the present time. The evidence that can survive baloney detecting isn't likely to satisfy either materialists or creationists. It seems for now as if new forms appeared mysteriously and by no known mechanism at various widespread separated times in the Earth's history. Maybe we'll be stuck with a mystery like that indefinitely, but I think it more likely that the 21st century will see a scientific revolution that will completely change our understanding of the history of life. If I'm right about that, the chance to participate in discovering that new understanding should be a thrilling prospect for young people looking forward to a career in science. What makes science sound boring is the impression the books give that the important things have already been discovered and all there is left to do is fill in the details. Show young people that there is a lot we don't know and that we may even be dead wrong about some of the things we do know is the way to fire their imagination. I don't know what theories the future may bring, but I think I know where the revolution will start. It will start with the realization that life is not the product of mindless natural forces. Life was designed. And we'll go on with chapter five in the next video. Thanks so much for listening. Please reach down, click like, and subscribe. Love you. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.